Yeah. The, the YouTube. I put the YouTube link. Yeah. Oh, no. They can watch that way. I thought you meant like come into the Zoom room. No, 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 no. Because like, you know how you have YouTube live? Because Tracy live? had that. We had it one time. Somebody came. Girl. <gasps> some random person. No. I was just like, no, no, no. no. That's hilarious. Who is that? We look yellow, though. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll do it from another. We'll do it from another vantage point at some point. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to, and we're going to start recording. Cause Wait. I'll, what you're already live aren't you i know we're already live but we're recording <laughs> too so hello everyone this is robin attorney robin mccoy with robin legal with our special guest um uh, my mentee camille time hi and so i know we talked about doing this a little bit earlier but we got caught up and you know we'll, <laughs> but we're we're here now folks so and this is uh what is this june 16th it's wednesday and so first I'm going to start, I'm going to read Camille's bio, and then we're going to ask her some questions. We're going to ask her to, you know, we want the youth perspective on some <laughs> things that are going on. So, okay. So Camille Tynes is a youth advocate, motivational speaker, and social entrepreneur. Her time navigating the broken child welfare system as a youth and then as a child welfare subject matter expert compelled Camille to dedicate her life to empowering disenfranchised communities and creating innovative solutions to complex social problems. Camille's passion for business, for using business as a means to affect positive social change inspired her to create Tynes Co. LLC from working with youth serving organizations, nonprofits and businesses to universities and government agencies, Tynes Co. strives to be a leader in providing strategic transformational consulting uh, that facilitates sustainable success. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in sociology. Go so you blue. and them in the house with their flow, go, go blue. <laughs> okay. So, and she focused on community development through law, justice, and social change. She's also a Fulbright scholar where she studied the intersection of business law and international investing at the Fulbright International Summer Institute in Bulgaria. Okay, Bulgaria, <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> Additionally, Camille is a certified youth development trainer and certified trainer of trainers through the Wakecard Center for Youth Program Quality and Forum for Youth Investment. Camille's knowledge and expertise in youth and community development is highly sought after. Camille was a, a requested guest lecturer at the University of Michigan, teaching a class of 90 undergraduate and graduate students on the importance of understanding the intersectionality of race, class, and politics in urban development to combat environmental racism. Fostering Success, Michigan's Policy Access Network solicited Camille's expertise in assisting them with establishing a statewide policy summit focusing, focused on analyzing and improving certain federal and state policy policies, practices, and procedures affecting Michigan's foster youth outcomes. Camille been doing a lot, y'all. Okay, so we're going to go through this. Okay, y'all, we're going to go through this. Okay, so Camille has been I a love featured... Me, <laughs> okay, so Camille has been a featured guest on the Michigan Public Radio, NPR, and Michigan Business Network discussing needed social reforms and ways businesses can help empower positive social change. Her advocacy and work have been honored by the Detroit City Council with the Spirit of Detroit Award, Detroit in the House! Okay, and recognized before the U.S. House of Representatives by Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Shout out to Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Okay. In 2018, Camille was selected as a U.S. delegate for the United De United States Department of State and the Asia Foundation's Youth Leaders Summit in Singapore. There she worked with other young leaders and entrepreneurs on ways uh, the U.S. and Southeast Asian nations could partner around business innovation and growth to solve global problems. Recently, Camille was selected to the White House appointed Associate Commissioner of Children's Bureau Roundtable. She provided policy recommendations and addressed Commissioner Schwangberg's uh, questions regarding setting the Biden-Harris administration's key priorities to support youth and families across the nation. She was also invited to meet and speak with Zhou jo Yoon Chang, the White House appointed Assistant as acting assistant secretary of the federal administration for child and families at the department of health and human services during the meeting camille discussed the importance of quality data and increasing the engagement of young persons 
with lived experience with governmental leadership and the child welfare system. Currently, Camille is the founding chair of the Third Circuit Court of Michigan Youth Engagement and Systems Improvement Committee within the Wayne County Family Juvenile Justice Division. Shout out to them. I used to work over there, okay, okay, with Michigan Children's Law Center. Camille <laughs> works closely with the deputy court administrator, judges, attorneys, and other key stakeholders to improve the outcomes of youth and family matriculating through the court. She's a firm believer, Camille, that within difficulty lies opportunities. Her newest venture, Connected, harnesses this concept by addressing the complex issues within the legal field and the child welfare system through an innovative software that improves the lives of youth and families while enabling lawyers, child welfare professionals, and the courts to operate more effectively and efficiently. I'm thrilled to announce, hey, okay, that <laughs> I'm thrilled to announce uh, that just a few short weeks ago, Camille's Tech Innovation won the prestigious Tech Town Detroit National Science Foundation STEM Entrepreneurial Excellence Program Business Competition People's Choice Award. And Camille is excited to begin her journey as a law student this fall and further develop her child welfare innovation to bridge the gap between technology and social impact that improves the lives of the most vulnerable. Okay, so that was a lot. Camille got a lot going on. I'm gonna make sure, you know, folks, make sure you share this interview because we've got this wonderful, amazing, exciting, talented young lady. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure to share it. You can go to Robin Legal uh, to uh, pull up the interview. Let's see, I'm pulling it up and I'm gonna share it on my uh, on my my social media. And let's see, we're doing this, I'm going in and it's asking me just a second. Okay, yep. And why are you doing that? Yes, yeah, so. Um... Yeah, so why don't we start Camille? <laughs> so, uh, so first let's talk about uh, what motivated you to create Times Co LLC? So um, after witnessing and continuing to see that there were so many injustices going on within our community and seeing um, how a lot of people were disconnected from resources okay, and how- talking to the, talk to the audience. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to her. So um, basically I started Times Co kind of a twofold method. One part of it was a little bit of a fluke, but the other part was connecting it to my passion. So I had already been working within the community um, since I was a teenager, uh, serving in different capacities. And so as I grew up, I kept seeing um, disconnects within our community where people were struggling and falling through the cracks unnecessarily uh, because either they didn't know resources existed or um, at times representatives of these organizations just weren't doing their job. So after working in capacities and volunteering and serving in capacities where I was connecting people with resources and doing training development, I went to this workshop and then a part of it was like, if you had a business, what would it be and what would you do? And at that time, I was not even thinking about um, creating a business. But then after going through the workshop, I was just like, wait, I connected the dots from my struggles and my pain and seeing my community's pains and struggles and then Times Co was birthed. Okay. And then, um, you know, as I read in your bio, I know that you have a bachelor's degree in sociology and focusing on community development through law, justice, and social change. And so what motivated you to have that focus? Um, I wanted to be a world changer. Like, no, that's what everybody says, right? Uh, but no, specifically, um, since I was about 14, I've always known that I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. Um, I had a fortunate but unfortunate experience of navigating through the family juvenile justice courts when I was younger. And I had an attorney who never met me um, and she went on record and basically put my life, my safety and jeopardy in harm's way because she didn't take the time to meet with me or even read my uh, case file. And so she recommended something that was very detrimental for me. And so in that moment I stood up and I advocated for myself and said, I never met her. I don't know what she's talking about. You guys know the reason why I said I don't want to go um, in that direction. And so then is where I made the decision that I was going to take whatever measures that I had to, to educate myself and put myself in a position to learn about the law so that I could uh, get a law degree. And so what better 
thing to study is sociology. So sociology co combines studying people, organizations, and systems to understand how they work so that you can affect change. And specifically, I wanted to understand how do I affect change within the community, within the legal systems and political systems since they all work hand in hand. So that's why I study sociology with that intense focus on law, social justice, and change. Okay, and then why don't you tell the audience, like you've got, as I said, you've got a really impressive background and resume and um, you, I know it, you, it talks in your bio, you, how you uh, were a U.S. delegate for the Department of State and the Asia Foundation and Youth Leaders Summit in Singapore. And so why don't you tell the audience, because you, you've been to Singapore, so yes. what, what was that like and what, what did that entail as far as the summit? So it was phenomenal. So um, the, for sure, it's Y Sealy is the uh, the summit. It is through it's a Department of State staple. It's a connection with Southeast Asian countries or ASEAN as they call it, and the Asia Foundation. They help um, co-sponsor it. So basically, every year there's a summit where they bring um, the young leaders from all across the U.S. and Southeast Asian countries together to meet connect and then specifically look at how we can grow businesses to work together to make money, of course, <laughs> but then also to solve certain social problems. Okay. And so we talked about everything from FinTech and I got to see some new things that have not hit the market yet. And I was just, I'm blown away to looking at um, how we can use businesses and technology to assist um, women and children over in Singapore and other countries. So it was phenomenal. I met people all the way from Laos to um, Brunei and everything in between and different ambassadors. So that was pretty much the gist of it was we got together, we looked at certain social problems, we looked at okay. ways that we could use business to again, generate more revenue um, and fintech and blockchain is huge. And before it actually really even start booming in the US heavy, they actually were already sent us over there to look into that and how we can um, do more partnerships. So that was pretty much what it was. And then there was a part that I love the most. We had an opportunity to go volunteer out in the community together with oh. all the leaders there. So I love, we handled our business. We looked at how to make money, how to grow and create uh, sustainable social change. But then we got to actually go throughout the community and um, meet the locals and the youth and see how we could be of support to them. That was amazing. And then I got to tour um, HP uh, Hewitt Packard and see uh, this the headquarters, meet the CEO of Twitter out in Singapore. Oh, that's cool. And so how long were you there for? I was there. The program was uh, only for a week, but then I stayed out uh, almost a month. So then I traveled over and I saw my friend in Malaysia too. So that was pretty awesome. Oh, that's... So I did Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. Okay. That's amazing. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And Oh, wait. The other Go amazing ahead. part was where we did our uh, celebration, our cel uh, uh, cra the movie Crazy Rich Asians. We were the wedding scene. That was the building that we had our uh, celebration in. So I was just like, that was awesome. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. I saw that friend. <laughs> I, when my friend Marsha and I first saw that movie, but yeah, I've seen it. I, gosh, I think I've seen it at least two times. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you also um, were selected um, for the to join the White House um, for the White House appointed associate commissioner of Children's Bureau Roundtable, mm -hmm. and and it and it says you provided policy recommendations that address uh, Commissioner Schomburg's questions mm -hmm. regarding. Um, setting the Biden administration's key priorities for youth and families across the nation. So I know the audience would ask, what do you think should be the key priorities for youth and family for the nation? So um, again, that was amazing. So the it's, I believe she's the first African-American female appointed as the associate commissioner of Children's Bureau. So that's pretty um, amazing and historic as well. Okay. Um, but so with meeting with Commissioner Sean Burke, she already had some um, priorities that she was thinking about, but I love how she took the time to ask me and the other uh, representatives, what we thought were necessary. And some of the things that are key in understanding how we can best serve youth and families across the nation, um, and, and even though specifically within navigating the child welfare system, I would say first and foremost, there needs to be more independent audits of the data. Um, because one of the things that I have seen working in this field for several years and on many different sides of it, whether working on it, the social work side or working on it, providing um, contracts and grants to different human service organizations doing the work or everything in between okay. is that if we don't have, we if we don't have authentic quality data, we cannot make data informed decisions that solves the problems. And so a few things would be making sure there's independent audits, making sure that within the audits, we're really getting the voices and experiences of the people that we're trying to 
serve, right? So whether that's the youth, the families, bio families, adoptive foster families, whoever is actually going through the system, we need to have their voices included in the process. In addition to um, hearing, of course, other um, agents and representatives of the system, whether that's a social worker, lawyer, or judge, but doing those independent audits, putting more resources to in-home treatments and services, because not all kids need to be removed from their home, right? So 70% of the kids that come through the foster care system are in it for neglect. And when you really break that down, what that really looks like oftentimes is a crime of poverty. So now you do have the other percentage that are in it for abuse. And it's understood that when there is like certain physical and extreme, some sexual abuse, you have to remove, right? Okay. So, but for right. those 70% of those kids, that are in the system and where it's annually at any given time about 400,000, we need to make sure that we're connecting families and youth with services that can allow them to thrive. So connecting with more resources, taking a more community-centered and community-minded approach. I love how the First Peoples or as some call Native Americans approach it. When um, there's a breakdown in a family structure, mm -hmm. instead of removing the kid from the home, they will actually send the community to support the kid. They get to remain in the home and you have other members of the community that either will come move in with the kid or will check up on them so that they can thrive as a unit. And then they'll still support the parent to either be rehabilitated or whatever resource they need. So those are just a couple things um, that I recommended to her. And then also, of course, okay. more engagement from people with lived experience, right? So whether it is, uh, a kid with the juvenile justice system or foster youth or a parent, we need to have a partnership and a community mindset with how we approach solving any problem. Right. Never do you have a successful business that doesn't listen to the customer, right? Okay. So, but within child welfare and within just serving youth and families, they're kind of really left out of the decision room. They're left out of the room when we're making solutions. And then mm -hmm. at the end, we're like, well, here's we're a solution that we experience. studied and created for you, adopt it. And then we're like, wait, why didn't this work? Because the people that are experts in it aren't at the table. So those are kind of some of the recommendations that I've provided. And okay. then also what I am, I am excited to see and hope to see uh, roll out as I know Commissioner Schomburg mentioned, under her leadership, she's really going to look and take a race equity lens at the child welfare system. Okay. And specifically, because there's overrepresentation of African American children within the system. And majority of them, I believe over 50% of them exit the system or age out and leave, and they never are reunited and never have a, um, a supporting adult. And so we know what happens to individuals that leave the system. Majority of them face homelessness, human trafficking, mental health issues, um, and so many other gamut of things at higher and alarming rates than the national are uh, the averages, including being incarcerated. So I'm excited to see and hope to see her work around looking at how to have more diversity, equity, and inclusion, and more racial and cultural sensitivity within the system. And I mean, and you, you know, I, my years of uh, working in this, within the system as a lawyer, guardian, a light, and a parent for kids, for children. I, yeah, I agree. There definitely needs to be, because you see disproportionately, you see poor folk and mm -hmm. black folk who, you know, kids are traumatized and ripped away from their, they're traumatized or something that happens and they get traumatized and then they're taken away, ripped away from their family, put in the homes of strangers. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they, it, it's worse. They have worse off abuse in foster care than if they, if you'd have just given them services in the yeah. home. And, and so for me, I know as a lawyer going to light them, I, and having also had the background as a parent's attorney, I was mindful of that. I didn't always just rush to go in and just take, let's just take this child away. Let's see if we can try to, uh, you know, get put resources in the home and, mm -hmm. and try to lessen the trauma. And because the flip side of it is I've had clients that were, um, that aged out and were like basically left hanging like homeless yep. or had, you know, I had one client had, a, had she had a child and, and they, there were just limited resources available mm -hmm. to her. And so it, it was just really disheartening to see the way that the system, you know, was working. I mean, sometimes we had successes and we had sometimes, you know, what is success to me? Success would mm -hmm. be, the parents would get it together and the kids would go back home and, and, you know, they get the resources that they can, uh, they need to make sure that they never come back in the system or success sometimes would be adoption in a healthy uh, environment. But then, as I said, other times kids, what's not successful is kids aging out yeah. and, and then you see, you know, kids going into the, either the juvenile justice system or yeah. they end up on the adult side. 
Uh, so I know you also work with the juvenile court on, and you work with the, you're the founding chair of the Third Circuit uh, Court of Michigan's Youth Engagement and Systems Improvement Committee. Mm -hmm. So can you tell our audience more about that? Like, what do you do for the committee and, and what are some, some, you know, prospects that you guys have for the future? Okay, thank you. Sure. So yes, um, as Attorney McCoy stated, I am the founding chair of the Youth Engagement and Systems Improvement Committee housed within the Third Circuit Court of Michigan's Family and Juvenile Court. So basically what I do, I chair that committee, but I also sit on the main committee as well. And what our aim and auspice is, is to make sure that we are reviewing the court's policies, practices, and procedures to make sure that they are indicative and inclusive of a system and programs that will support youth and families thriving so that we can combat those outcomes. Because the court, and we're very aware that I believe it's 70% of young men who age out of the system um, have had contact, has either been charged with some type of either crime, I believe it's a felony at some point in their life, and 60% of the young men when they leave the system are incarcerated at right. some age before 21. That's ridiculous, right? So what I'm doing with the committee is trying to um, push a new wave of understanding how we look at servicing youth and families that come through the court and look at it as a partnership or a community mindset. So what we're hoping to see is um, a youth board and more youth integration within the court and then looking at transforming some of the practices and procedures to make sure that we are including youth and young people at the table and that we have wraparound services for the youth. And that comes also first with making sure that um, not just providers, but also the lawyer guardian at Lydams and everyone that's supporting youth are aware of what a kid needs. And one of the things um, that bothered me, that troubled me the most, but also allowed me to see the potential for us to affect great change was that a lot of um, parties within the court, whether it may be a judge, a referee, um, okay. a lawyer, at times they don't even know what the law is or what resources a child is supposed to have by law, right? Okay. And then even at times when I've talked with their social workers, sometimes they find it difficult to connect um, a youth with the proper service or a service provider that is available because sometimes there's waiting lists that are ridiculously long before we can get kids um, the information, the resources that they need. So through this committee, my aim and my hope is to make sure that we bring everybody to the table. So whether it is the court, it is other stakeholders, um, other child welfare practitioners and youth and DHHS all in one spot and to work together on addressing those barriers that okay. are preventing us from succeeding and creating a model that can be replicable in other states too. Okay. And then why don't, you know, I know, as I said, you have this awesome background and um, a lot of things that you're doing, a lot of activities. So why don't you tell the audience more about Connected? Like what is Connected? And you just got the award. So congratulations <laughs> for that. So tell the audience Thank more you. about Connected. What is that? So Connected is a software as a platform service that allows uh, the child welfare system to seamlessly connect in one place. What most people don't know is currently uh, the way that the child welfare system is structured digitally is very disconnected. Everybody kind of works in their independent silos and communication can come through, uh, communication and access and data comes through so many different um, portals, whether it's just a regular phone call, an email odyssey or um, outdated uh, my Saxwood systems, all these different things. Um, are preventing seamlessly working together. So what Connected does is in one centralized place allows, uh, whether it's the youth themselves, the parent, the lawyer, uh, any other court official or DHHS or any other youth servicing organization to be able to go in one place and access data and share it in real time about um, what's going on with the youth and what they need. So that's kind of in a nutshell what Connected does. And I'm so excited uh, to pilot this out. We already have Michigan Children's Law Center who signed up to be one of the beta testers. Okay, um, hey, that's where I used to work. Shout out to the Michigan Children's Law Center. Linda, <laughs> Eleanor, yes, hey y'all, hey, hey y'all. They are phenomenal. Um, Vivek Sankron from the University of Michigan's Law School, the Child Advocacy Center, they've signed up. Okay, and, shout out uh, to Vivek. Yes, hey. To Vivek. Um, yeah. And then as well as uh, Attorney Maisa T and her uh, law firm. So I'm so excited to see how we can continue to further this. And um, I'm just really, really excited. So. Okay, so if I'm somebody in the audience and I'm listening to this about your new program and I want to I want to 
can either be involved, like maybe they want to donate or help you. Like how, how do they get in contact with you? What's the best way? So you can either go to our website and go to connected.us, that's K-O-N-N-E-C-T-E-D dot U-S, or shoot me an email at I-N-F-O at times, my last name, T-Y-N-E-S dot C-O. And we'll get right back with you uh, about how you can engage or donate and support. Okay. And then I also want to turn, you know, I mean, we've kind of talked about some things in your resume, but I want to talk to you because about, and I mean, I know you and I have conversations about some of these things, but let's talk to the audience like about how, how, well, first, how have you been doing during the pandemic and coping with the pandemic? And then what, what advice you have for other youth that are out there that are trying to deal with being, you know, surviving during this pandemic, you know, Mm -hmm. going to school or dealing with depression. Yeah. So can you tell the audience more about like, first start with yourself and then what guidance you would have for other young people or even parents that are um, dealing with young people that are having some struggles. Mm -hmm. So navigating the pandemic um, still comes with these challenges, right? And initially for me at first, it was, um, it was very challenging because it was a shift in things financially, mentally, emotionally. I'm, I'm a very much extrovert person. Right, <laughs> right. So um, I love people and I love connecting with people. And so um, things shutting down, work slowing down and stopping it. And then having friends um, pass away from COVID so right. abruptly, um, it really did affect me emotionally. And then there was one moment where we were afraid that my uh, my niece, she was three years old at the time. Right, I remember. She had COVID and you it told was me just, about that. It was so scary. Um, and just, it, what, it, well, COVID, it, it, it hurt me to have to go through that loss but it also showed me the importance of um, really enjoying the moment and spending time with people who matter the most to you. Because at the end of the day, um, there will always be work. There will always be something to do, but you have to prioritize your own physical, mental health and your emotional health through connecting with the proper people that you love. And so um, this, this time during the pandemic, yes, it came with challenges, but when I I shifted my own perspective. I'm, I'm really big about gratitude and looking at what can you be grateful for, even in the most hellish situations, because as you live life, you're going to go through something. You're going to go through something. <laughs> y'all. For real. I don't care who you are. I don't, it doesn't matter how much money you have or a little money or where you are in life. You're going to go through something. And it's not always about what happens to you, but how you, um, how you look at it. And I had to look at it and say, hey, this hurts. This sucks. This is scary. There's people that I love that I'll never see again, uh, ever ever again. But what can I do now? I can reach out to the people that I I love and let them know I I miss them. Can I Zoom with them even though I can't see them physically? Like uh, my grandfather, he's in his 80s and it hurts that I can't see him. And so what I do now is I'll either duo chat with him or I went up to his house and uh I stood outside of the window, had to do on so that he could hear me okay. and so we could see each other that way. So I've done that. And then just um, for myself, I've really allowed this to be a season and a moment for me to do self-evaluation and reflection. Okay. So, um, so whether that means doing yoga, I do a whole lot of yoga now, y'all. I take like three walks a day. <laughs> okay, look at you. I'm not a person who likes staying in the house. I right, right. I love to walk too. When the weather gets warm, you're going to see me walking. Y'all see pictures of attorney Ed and I out there on the lake with Listen, the geese. With the, yeah, I take a walk morning, lunch break, in the evening. <laughs> and that's something that I have to do. Other people have to um, see what works best for them. So I start journaling more. Okay. Um, I've really dug down into looking at what I want to do with my life and specifically how I can get there and not just how I can get there, but how I can prioritize and balance health. Because sometimes okay. I used to work too hard uh, and I would not prioritize my health. Okay. Right. <laughs> so this season made me see um, the most important thing is real balance. So that's kind of how I've navigated this pandemic um, is just with my focus on being grateful for the moment, appreciating the people around me and exploring myself and challenging myself in different ways through yoga 
and going after my heart's desire and then also starting this new venture connected <laughs> yes, which is awesome 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 and then so what advice do you have like you know i've talked on some of the other uh robin legals about what we did with uh black women lawyers we brought in some uh therapists to talk to the group and be available to some of the members if they needed therapy um you know i don't hide about you know i have a therapist who and when i need to see my talk to my therapist i call mm -hmm. her up i do a zoom i do a phone call because everybody mm -hmm. so what do you have as for suggestions for again children kids that are out there that are you you know you've got kids that i mean you and i too we're both we're like people person we're extroverted and i uh, and you know, I, I teach, I like teaching in person. I had to do a virtual and it, so the kids have had to do virtual teaching, like basically sitting on the computer for hours, looking at the computer as opposed to being in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So what guidance do you have for kids that are kind of struggling with, with kind of like the isolation? I would say that's a challenging one, right? Um, because kids, you never know what pre-existing health condition a child may have. And so I would say if you're a kid and you're struggling, talk with your parent or your guardian about what activities that um, they feel comfortable and that you feel comfortable doing. So whether that is um, a group of you and your friends playing like kickball or even playing um, kickball or soccer or baseball, right? Because it, it allows you to still interact with people but then they're still social distancing. So see if maybe um, you guys can either make a date to go to the park or go to the movies. That's something that I did. And we were still socially distanced, which was great, but we could still interact. Um, so things of that sort. So also, if you like to journal, journal, um, take walks, exercise together. Those are certain things that you still can do and certain activities that you can do at a socially distance way where you still can be um, compliant with CDC recommendations and still not put your health at risk. So those are ways to navigate it. And then also um, don't be afraid or ashamed to take the initiative and maybe even start like um, a support group or just like a peer group with your friends where you guys can either Zoom together or FaceTime or do and talk about how you're either struggling with navigating through this pandemic, um, be open to even have another like a peer support specialist or a therapist like navigate you guys through or even uh i would recommend <laughs> some people may not but like do a weekly roast right where you crack jokes on what was the worst things that you went through that week with your friends okay and then turn it into something fun where you can laugh about like what i do with my friend um he and i sometimes for cathartic relief we'll talk about the worst things that happen and then sometimes we'll spin it away and spin in the way that it, it just we either spin it or tell the story in a way that's really humorous and so instead of crying about something you laugh about it or you laugh while you cry so okay taking the time to really sit with yourself or with another adult and just seeing what are some activities that you can do and what are some ways that you could potentially um cope and navigate through this pandemic because it is hard and recognizing too it's okay not to be okay. It's okay for and normal that you're struggling through this pandemic. This is, um, we've never been through this before. We in this generation, right? Um, pandemics have happened before, but this is our first time us millennials and other young people really navigating this type of experience. So just to know things get better, um, never make a permanent decision in a temporary, because of a temporary situation and be, um, be brave and know that it's okay to reach out for help and to try something different. Okay. Now I also wanna to talk to you. I mean, I know we've talked on the phone about it, but I also, and I've talked to some other guests about it, but you know, we've also, you know, you know, I do programming on what to do and stop by the police. Mm -hmm. And in the course, I've been doing that for a number of years in the middle schools, high schools and colleges uh, with the general public. And in the course of that, I mean, we've been seeing the brutalization of black men, women and children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the course of the pandemic, you had the, the murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin. And then you have the trial where they kept looping the video mm -hmm. and you're seeing him being killed by Derek Chauvin. And we're actually coming up well, next week, they're gonna be sentencing Derek Chauvin. So can you tell the audience, like, I don't know, did you watch any of the trial or, or any of the highlights? And what, what are your thoughts uh, about that particular case? And then the general issues with police um, you know, with, with, with the instances of brutalization of black men, women, and children. I did watch part of the trial. Um, and I, I had to 
take a step back because it was really emotionally bothering me because what we watched was not a police brutality. We did not see excessive force from a police officer. What we saw was an individual who had hatred and, and just to be frank, a racist individual do a public lynching. He murdered him in cold blood. Okay. I believe in respect for the law. I appreciate um, my men and women who carry the mantle of being a police officer or a police woman. But what I do not respect is a society and a group of people or an individual who believes that a uniform, a piece of clothing, an oath gives someone the blanket permission to be the judge, jury, and executioner in one moment. Okay. And so what I saw was so egregious. And even though in the trial, I know they went for charges that they believe they could have won against, I'm glad they did. But I truly believe he did, he deserved to be charged with first degree or at least second degree murder. So when I consistently see right. in our society, the mass murder of women and men and even children at the hands of law enforcement, and we consistently have the same conversations about, we need to do more training. We need to do more training. I do believe that training is can be beneficial but we need to take a different approach if, as has been said many times before, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting and hoping a different result. It's insane okay. for our society, for our legal system to remain the same and complacent when we see consistently officer after officer, incident after incident of people being murdered who weren't a threat, who were not aggressive, who had no weapon. I believe we need to do truly systemic reform within the police departments, within sentencing guidelines and structures. Um, because one thing that we keep missing, we're appealing to people's humanity. And at the end of the day, I can never regulate somebody's heart, their emotions or their perceptions and belief systems, right? Okay. You can do education and you potentially can help someone see the light. I have a good friend of mine. When I first met her, she was a trip and her father was a Klansman. And okay. Had one at that. Okay. And she went from saying very racist things and us not getting along to now we've traveled the world together and she now just married um African American men and just had two beautiful biracial children. Okay. Right? That's that's a that's a lot, y'all audience. That's a big so, leap to go from having a father to clansman <laughs> and racist <laughs> and then going so, ahead and marrying a brother. Yeah. So it's definitely possible, right? And but she's a civilian, an individual person. She doesn't have the direct power and potential to her to take somebody's life if say she did not see the light of her ways but what we need to do within reforming the police is to make the structures and accountability such that if you intentionally go out whether you show intentionality or not if you are careless if you are negligent within your approach to policing the community it needs to come out of your pocket whether your personal pocket or your pension i think if we start seeing more of that I believe we will see less, I was afraid for my life, so I killed this person. Right, and I know you said that they should have, they did charge him with second degree murder. Um, they didn't charge him with first degree murder because they said you had to but I agree with you. I mean, it went from them saying what, 8.46 minutes to then they corrected it and said 9.29 minutes. And so I'm like, you know, premeditation is like you're lying away, like you, you have time to form the thought so nine minutes and 29 seconds is a long time. That, I'm like, and then to lean first in. First degree. First degree. Okay. And you on camera. I just, it still just gets me that you're on camera. And then in the midst of the George Floyd trial that they go out and kill another brother. And I, I mean, that is just insane. And then you got Ronald Green, you got new cases and we still for Brianna Taylor, like you guys can see on, I interviewed Lenita Baker, one of the lead attorneys, or she's a lead attorney for 
Breonna Taylor, they still haven't had any, uh, they didn't arrest any of the officers involved with that in Kentucky. I know we've had a change of the laws and, um, you know, so Camille, we have the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I, you know, I've done a, I did a video about that. And uh, what are your thoughts about that? The fact that it's held up by the Senate, it's, it's held up. I mean, it's, how do you feel as a young person that you can have these atrocities that are happening to to black men, women, and children. Uh, you know, there was a, a Hispanic young man that was killed in Chicago. So you got brown folk catching it. You got Native American. You got kids with disabilities. There was an mm -hmm. autistic child that was shot. So what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, the issue of qualified immunity in the police and, and you know, the, and the issue of, like, they haven't passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? My mom always told me, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. So, but I won't, <laughs> <laughs> I won't employ that right now. I will say this, actions speak louder than words. I understand that in such a, um, a high stakes position, you don't want to be abridging your decision-making because if you make the wrong decision, you can potentially be held liable at an extremely high, um, you can be held extremely liable. At however, a high rate, yeah. However, police officers undergo training. Although I think their level of training is not sufficient enough because you have to spend more time in school and training to get your petitions licensed than you do to become a cop. And I think that's problematic in and of itself. Right. And in but, Europe, I know they can have it where you can go to school for three years to become a police officer. You know, they make it it's a longer period of time. It takes longer to literally be a certified cosmetologist than it does to become a police officer. Did you know that? I don't know. I don't think I knew that. Audience, it's ridiculous. Hey, learn something too. Hey. There's some other racial aspects behind that too. They actually wanted to make it harder for African American women to get their license. And that, long story short, they made it easier to, um, because white women like getting their realtor's license for over African American women trying to actually get their, um, their license certification as a petition. But anyhow, the law is so interesting. Uh, but, but as a young person, how do you feel? As, because I think about the fact that, you know, we have, you know, we have these, uh, there's been in the news lately, Biden is over, um, you know, there's the, um, the meeting with world leaders and America has had a history of going around uh, to other countries and talking about uh, human rights and protecting, you know, making sure that the other people in the world are not uh, oppressed by dictatorships or, or their governments. And then you have America you know, the world is looking at America and looking at, okay, y'all sitting here talking to us, but look at the way y'all treating black men, women, and children. So how do you, as a young person, can you give the audience the, the young person's perspective? Like, what do you think is the solution? Um, you know, cause I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit more mature and I'm like, this is messed up. But I mean, as, as a young person, like, what are you, what's your perspective about, what do you think is the solution to all these problems? So I'll answer that. I, I want to finish um, answering the, okay. the preceding question real quick. So as a young person, how do I feel about them holding up, putting reforms that can potentially save and protect um, Black men and women and kids and people of color? Personally, I feel that it's, I personally think there's a deliberate assault against um incarcerating our people and disenfranchising our community and so at times when I see a broken system I don't believe it's broken but it's a well-oiled capitalistic machine that is consistently taking the lives of people for profit whether that is through execution or murdering them or through incarcerating them so that's my personal belief right um and actually I did um one of my thesis for college about that and I actually proved my case on it okay uh, but nonetheless go ahead, I'm a go ahead. <laughs> Future attorney Camille Tynes. Go ahead. Because it's too where she's currently an advocate, youth advocate, Camille Tynes. <laughs> I'm an admitted law student, so hey, law, uh, admitted okay. law student, shooting this future lawyer. Right. But yes, um, so my more um, watered down and more palatable response will be this. Again, actions speak louder than words. As a young person, I see, when I see legislation go forth that can protect animals, that can protect other um, peoples of other races that are oftentimes, yes, much needed, get pushed through with the quickness. 
but yet protections for that are specifically geared towards the plight of African Americans. But again, anything that benefits African Americans have always benefited everyone. When I see that being held up and abridged, what I see is a society that still has not come to the realization or atonement of the racist white supremacist society that America was founded on. We're not okay. struggling with the concept of morality or right or wrong, or even in my personal opinion about qualified immunity, because you have some of the most brilliant minds and strongest negotiators who have effectively accomplished and brokered other deals, right? But on this one, there always seems to be difficulties and delays, whether it's talking about police brutality and reforming the law, or whether it talks about um, reparations for African-American communities. Right. Almost right. every other group. Folks, y'all can check out my videos too about reparations. I talk about reparations, the case for <laughs> reparations, okay? She, she, she triggered me here on the reparations. On the reparations, people like, what are we going to do about reparations? Okay, you can give cold hard cash money. For okay, land okay, uh, don't have to pay for college. No taxes. No, okay, no taxes. That's why I, that's my big one. No taxes. Okay, um, no have to pay for college. Okay, um, you know, wipe out the student. Hey, you can wipe out my student loans. Okay, okay, just there's a whole bunch. Uh, help with housing, employment because there's just been a systematic oppression in this country. Um, but so yeah, don't. There's a whole list of things for reparations. So it's like you and you know the Japanese were interned. And during World War II, and then they got reparations. I teach this in my class. I talk about in the class on law and African-American experience, we talk about the oppression of black people, but we also cover, talk about the oppression of Native Americans, Asians, mm -hmm. uh, Latinos. Uh, but it's like, it's time for black folks to, uh, we, not only did we build this country, we still build, we still are the front, uh, uh, you know, a high number of us are frontline workers uh, on the scene and being mistreated and mm -hmm. and it's and then we go try to go to other countries and talk about how they treat people america needs to look in the mirror okay look in the mirror okay camille go back to what you were saying I know I, <laughs> see, she got me on a tangent y'all go ahead go ahead okay she got me yeah. triggered me i'm sorry the better word is trigger go ahead I'm, what so you're you what were you saying you were saying about so basically i'm disappointed and disheartened i don't think this is a matter of um, still negotiating around the qualified immunity, although that's what the talks are saying. Because when we look at history, it's the same arguments, the same things that are being said, the same, in my words, I would say excuses that are being said. There's a book called We Charge uh, Genocide, the Crime of Government Against the Negro People. Okay. And this was African Americans trying to um, work with and use the United Nations as a vehicle to bring up the issues of the mass murders and lynching of African-American people and that done by the police, right? right. Way back then. And so um, I believe the president that signed said there was not enough murders of African-American people to even justify having like UN involvement. It was just, or even the United States doing anything to address it. And this was brought before the United Nations, right? right. I think it was under... FDR, but don't quote me that. You can look it up and look up the book yourself. So, okay, because the issues that we're facing, Robin, and that we're seeing with police brutality against African American and people of color, um, the issues that we're having around more conversations about there's not enough cultural competency, we need more training. These are the same excuses and the same rhetoric that's been echoed throughout centuries, not okay. just the 40s, 50s, or 60s. And so just kind of looking at history and looking at uh, legal history and the research and the books and even some of the great prolific um, writers, they have all echoed the same issues. So for me, when I look at this current structure, I don't see um, a broken system anymore. I see a system that is operating in a capacity in which it was created to disserve, right? The people in, of color the African-Americans and benefit financially off of them. So going into the solution, I don't believe the solution is gonna come from the system. I don't. I believe the that we are the change. We the people, we the young people. Okay. We the men and women, we the community. We the African-American, black, brown community, white, Asian, we the community, the people. What we have to recognize is at the end of the day, 
a threat to justice within us or here is a threat to justice everywhere for you as well. Right. And that's what I think sometimes people forget is that the problem may be affecting one group more, but the solution will benefit all. And that same problem can affect others later on. Just like right. the evolution right of the war on drugs. There's a great documentary called The House I Live In that you guys should watch and, and pull it up. It basically talks about the evolution of the law and how it's used being tough on crime as a way to incarcerate certain people and benefit off of them financially off of their incarceration. Now, I do believe that you have to have governance. I do believe in a law. I do believe in justice, morality, and I'm not pro illegal drugs, not at all. What I'm saying, what we have to recognize is that sometimes the systems that we think are benevolent aren't as such. And that either whether intentionally or unintentionally, there are processes, procedures, and policies and laws that continue exas to exacerbate issues and benefit financially from those people's demise. So The House I Live In is a good documentary that breaks it down. And it shows not only how African-Americans were affected by the crack epidemic, but also um, whites with heroin as well. And it basically goes around and looks at each racial group and how at certain points in time, certain drugs were classified as such and were penalized in such a way to keep certain groups out of the workforce and also to benefit off of them financially. And initially uh, people thought it wouldn't affect their race. And then it shows black, white, Asian, Native American, everybody mm -hmm. the system touched at one point to financially benefit off of them. So, but nonetheless, back to the solution. I believe the solution comes from us and our, it, it comes from us to push it, but then it also has to be codified in law. So we do have to work with those that are in power, those that, um, are the power holders. And I think we definitely need to get back to the community policing model. We definitely need to integrate restorative justice models. Um, and, and what community policing looks like too, for those who aren't aware, you can have um, either independent like police stations, not independent, let me clarify. You can have it where the police don't look at you as a threat, but they live in your community. They come and they hang with you and you really understand that who's serving you is there to serve, protect and serve and not just to police. And you can have it where you have certain court hearings that are in more community friendly spots, whether that can be a library or a school gymnasium, just to make it less adversarial and aggressive for certain crimes, of course. Or even in the schools, like in New York, they have it where the kids yep. run the courts for the juvenile matters and the kids decide what's going to happen in their own environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I think it can be less adversarial. And I mean, I think about the police, like in California, they said that they they had a setup where in some places like where they, the, the police are for supposed to be guardians of the children. You know, I just came uh, from uh, interviewing some clients and a uh, situation with some kids that were, uh, you know, it's been in the media with some, some drama with some kids being traumatized by a person. And uh, kids should be embraced and should be loved on and not be shot at and not be, not somebody trying to run them down with a car or somebody, you know, shouldn't have that trying to trying to take them, take them out with a sledgehammer, trying to shoot them. That's just, that's outrageous. It's just mm -hmm. outrageous. We kill children well, are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. And, you know, we should be treating them, making sure that they have the best environment mm -hmm. as possible. Uh, we should be nurturing them, you know, uh, and building them up so they, they can go on to be successful leaders. Mm -hmm. We should not be seeing situations where the police, and it's not just the police, there's other people out there in the community that are mistreating our children, you know, like situations, I, I know the one, the situation that was in the news with the, the lady who thought that the young man had stolen her phone and then she tried to accost the young man and his father. She tackled him, she assaulted yeah, him. Yeah, and I'm like, no, that is not cool at all. These are children, you know, even, even if the child does do something, you, you know, come on. I mean, he didn't, and he didn't do anything. He was innocent, mm -hmm. but it's, it's like, we, that's the issue we have with America. We have a caste system. There's a disparity of treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm in court every day and I see predominantly, I represent a predominantly black men. And, and then you see other folk and I represent some white folk too, poor white folk, working class white folk. But when I, I just see disparity of treatment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
in the court system and, mm -hmm. and it's wrong. And the kids look at, you tell kids right and wrong, but then you treat people differently based on race, class, gender, and, that, and that's wrong. I'm sorry, I interrupted mm -hmm. you were saying. No, no, you were talking and you were saying that it's outrageous basically how we do not protect or value um, our children. And I say they don't value the lives of African-American children because it's shown through their actions and what they do. I was going to say what was outrageous too was how that judge thought it was okay to put his bond at $10,000 and let him walk and tell him uh, she wishes him the best at the end. I right. thought that was outrageous. My words, not yours, but that's ridiculous. So we cannot allow people who who are supposed to protect us and be um, neutral parties, but committed to justice, speak in such a way and operate in ways that shows us a clear level of bias and that shows us a clear level of not having the intent to represent justice to the fullest extent of the law. So we have to learn how to step up and run for need us seniors we need us to be us we are beautiful brilliant people and i'm talking about everybody but specifically my black brothers and sisters we have to reprogram our minds and give ourselves the truth and learn about our history not just slavery slavery is only one small piece of our history it was for over 400 years and we still have another form of it manifesting now yes but you and i both need to go back and learn about our history as kings and queens from the motherland and also as inventors and innovators right here in this country right we are not just thugs and all this that you see on tv you need to go back and read a book and connect back to your brilliance so that you can release the the power and the call that's inside of you, whatever, whatever may be, whether a teacher, a pastor, a nurse, or just a mother, right? Or a father, you have a specific purpose and call in life. And when you are not in your position, you cannot allow yourself to fully blossom and you aren't there to be that light to someone else or be in that courtroom to advocate for someone who needs your assistance. Because our society will be left with people who do not look like us, who will be in positions of power that don't care about us and will continue to think that a child is a threat and will kill them without looking at any other way to disarm them. Or you'll have judges on the bench who over sentence us, right. or who allow people who deserve to literally be locked up immediately and be denied bond. You'll have those judges allow them to go basically clear free. We need you. Right, right. No, I agree. I think that everybody has genius within them. And it's a matter of uh, having it cultivated to manifest. We all have a purpose of what we're meant to do. Like, you know, um, you know, you're on track for law school. I'm a lawyer, advocate, activist. And so you're a youth advocate. You're out there. You, you're affecting policy and change. And you have your own, you know, connected. You have your own business. And uh, so I do want to wrap it up because I know uh, we are pressed for time. But so you are embarking on this adventure and I, you know, it's great to have you here. And I know I'm sure we're going to have you come back and talk about some other topics because, you know, we got some stuff to talk about. OK, but so, Camille, why don't you tell the audience? So you you're about to go to law school mm -hmm. and um, I'm excited for you, you know, because law school is can be so exciting and engaging, um, especially some of the you know, you take some really exciting classes. Um, what are your prospects for the law? Like what what kind of areas are you planning to study? And then what do you plan to do once you have a law degree? So I am not limiting myself. I am open to learning and exploring, which I'm what I'm most interested in right now is uh, like human rights law, child welfare law, business law, and really getting my feet wet in that to just kind of see. And I actually I just I took a contracts law class um, and I ended up finding out I actually really like contracts. So okay. I'm open to kind of exploring that. And even um, as I've been working on uh, getting my IP for my software, I'm even open to like exploring a little bit about IP law. But specifically, I know for a fact that I will practice like human rights, child welfare law and business. Okay. So um, business law. I What I plan to do in the future is to have, of course, my own law firm. Uh, so 
Yes. I have a great mentor. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we sit here, ladies and gentlemen, we are at McCoin Associates. Yes. Black and on law firm. Black on law firm. Father, daughter. <laughs> Generational yeah. lawyer. Rod Green is with us. <laughs> and Camille worked with <laughs> us and was wonderful, was fabulous. So, yes. Yes. So, I plan to have my own law firm. And then since I know that justice at times does not just come through the justice system, um, I want to have a community and economic empowerment center where I work with people in the community and teaching them how to have their own um, form of justice through economic empowerment. So starting their own business, but then also still teaching them advocacy. So I want to have my own law firm and community and economic development center. So that's what I plan to do in the future. Okay, so Camille, this has been wonderful. And once again, let's say somebody is watching this interview and they want they want to connect with you, they want to help support you mm -hmm. in some form or fashion. How do they get? How do we get connected with you? Sure, either you can call me directly on my cell phone at uh, my business cell phone at seven three four seven five seven five nine eight six. That's seven three four seven five seven five nine eight six, or email us at i n f o times. That's t y n e s dot c o. And we'll get back with you via email or you can go to connected. That's K-O-N-N-E-C-T-E-D dot U-S. Okay, so folks, this has been Robin Legal. This has been attorney Robin McCoy and youth advocate Camille Tynes. And you can, uh, we, we're on, we're on uh, YouTube. We're also on Twitter. I will put the handles on there. We're on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn too. I'm on Facebook. So uh, everybody have a blessed day. Stay safe. And remember, knowledge is power. Um, you know, and I, you know, I've talked about this before. I'm working on expungements. That's what I'm doing. So I'm trying to help folks get their records cleared. We have new laws in Michigan. You can check out my videos about that, about just basically helping the people to redeem themselves and have redemption. So everybody stay, stay, stay blessed, stay woke, be blessed, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Robin, for the invitation. Thank, Thank you, you, Camille. <laughs>